All right, uh, if we could uh, turn, please, uh, in our Bibles uh, to the book of Judges and chapter 9. And I'm going to read um, the first six verses, although Lord willing, we'll get further than that. But uh, it says, uh, it, beginning in verse 1 of Judges 9, And Abimelech, the son of Jerobal, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren, and communed with them, and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it be better for you, either that all the sons of Jerobal, which are threescore and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren spake to him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, and all these words, <clears throat> and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bereth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. And he went unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren the sons of Jerobal being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding yet, Jotham, the youngest son of Jerobal, was left, and he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together and all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. Shechem. And again, God will bless that reading of his word to us uh, this this morning. Uh, so our, our message today is very simple. It's, it's about the man who would be king, the man who would be king. And it's interesting that uh, this is uh, the book of Judges. And remember when we began, maybe it's too far away that we can remember it, but there was, there was really some discussion about whether there were 12 judges or 13 judges. And all the debate really centers around this individual, uh, was he a judge or was he not a judge? And I would suggest to you that he wasn't a judge. He certainly wasn't a man raised up by God as a deliverer. He was a man who imposed himself and set himself up and certainly didn't produce any deliverance for the children of Israel. Now, just some general comments about this chapter. First of all, it's the longest chapter in the book of Judges. And not only is it the longest chapter, it's probably the most depressing chapter in the book of Judges. Uh, I mean, uh, at least it's up there. There's some more pretty depressing chapters to come, but this is up there as one of the most depressing chapters. And I think it's good, uh, we might read a verse from the book of Jeremiah just for uh, kind of setting the scene of what we're going to consider today. And it's from Jeremiah 45 and verse 5. And it's words uh, that are spoken uh, to uh, Baruch, uh, the son of Neriah, uh, from Jeremiah. And it says this, verse 5, And seekest thou great things for thyself, seek them not. Okay, I'm just going to, that's all I'm going to read. Seekest thou great things for thyself, seek them not. And so really that's what's going on here. He is a man who wants a place. He, he's seeking a position. Uh, he's seeking great things for himself. So, as we've uh, learned last time, we find ourselves once again in a day of declension, a day of departure. Uh, after the deliverance that Gideon had brought, remember we saw last time when Gideon died, people pretty much go back to their old ways once again. And we also are going to see the seed sown. If you remember last week, our message was on uh, the bad seed. Uh, that was sown by Gideon, well, that bad seed that was sown by Gideon is about to produce a terrible harvest, and we're going to witness that harvest today. So seeds sown in his twilight years will come to full fruition. And again, we mentioned that we're very vulnerable in victory. Uh, sometimes uh, when we're experiencing victory, uh, it can be a very vulnerable place for us and temptations can come. And that's what we found with Gideon. And so we've got to be very careful what we saw, because we know that there's a principle in the word of God that we reap 
what we sow. And we're going to see that what Gideon uh, basically sowed in his twilight years, he is now, or the nation is about to reap the consequence. And so remember, he had a son um, by his concubine. And of course, we read that in chapter 8, verse 31, and his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he he called, again, Gideon called him Abimelech. And so, of course, his origin um, was was connected with an unspiritual connection, really. It it was uh, on the part of Gideon. Uh, He, instead of his, his legitimate wives, he had this concubine. And so there's this unspiritual connection. And often that's Satan's way of working. It formed a connection that was not spiritual, like similar to Abraham taking Hagar, that made from Egypt. And uh, there were disasters as a result of it that have been felt. The the repercussions of the Hagar incident are being felt in our world to this very hour. And so there are incredible consequences of choices that we make. Uh, I remember years ago uh, hearing a very sobering sermon on the awesome consequence of choice. And it's true. Uh, there, There are consequences to choices that we make. And he Uh, went after this woman, not content with his many wives. He went after this concubine. She had a son. And then he calls the son Abimelech, which, as we saw last time, means my father is king. And even though Gideon had refused kingship, uh, yet by calling his son, my father is king, he was acting like a king. He was saying, you know, I didn't take the position, but I, I certainly have been very kingly in my ways. And so we also saw that not only did we have this, uh, this uh, union uh, that was not wholesome uh, with this concubine, but we also saw at the end of chapter eight, uh, again, some of the seeds sown that verse 33, it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their God. And of course, I do believe there return to Baal worship was speeded on its way by Gideon's ephod in verse 27. Uh, If you remember in chapter 8, verse 27, Gideon made an ephod thereof, put it in his city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare to Gideon and his house. And so, again, these seeds that were sown uh, in his family life, uh, in the national life of Israel, uh, are about to reap a terrible harvest because there was just a short leap from ephod worship to Baal Bereth worship, Baal of the covenant. The other thing we notice in chapter nine is that there's no repentance or crying out to God in this incident. Uh, the people refuse to repent. There's no repentance seen at all. And God is hardly mentioned in the chapter, although we will see later on in the story that uh, just like often in Scripture, times like the book of Esther, where God is not named, but God is working behind the scenes. And we're going to see God is going to work behind the scenes in this chapter, even though he's not in the front and center of public life. In fact, they've tried to exclude God from public life. They've turned back to Baal. Uh, of the covenant. uh, And that's where their hearts are. And so God is not mentioned. He's not part of it, but he's still working. And isn't it wonderful, by the way, to to know that even when uh, men reject God, it doesn't mean that God is not still at work behind the scenes. And uh, we believe that, that he's a God who's always working. Uh, Lord Jesus said, my father worketh hitherto and I work. And while ever this world is in its ruined condition because of sin, the Lord Jesus says we can't rest. The Father and the Son are working actively to bring about redemption and restoration. And so it's good to know that even here, even though God's not mentioned, he's still at work. And we'll point that out as we go. We also saw that Gideon's sons were neglected uh, as a result of um, them turning from God. Verse 35 of chapter 8, neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. 
And we pointed out that uh, part of that was they weren't really thankful. They, they, there was an ingratitude. And that ingratitude led to idolatry. It, yes, it, it practically it led to the neglect of Gideon's family, even though Gideon had done so much for the nation. But it also uh, tragically uh, led them to idolatry, just like we see in the New Testament in the Epistle to the Romans, that you see that principle that when people are not thankful, it's just the first step uh, in the slippery slope that leads to idolatry. And again, I think about the nations that we live in, um, the U.S. and Canada. I always thought it was impressive that they had Thanksgiving days. But, but overall, I would suggest that, generally speaking, people in, in, in these great countries that have so much uh, of beauty, so much of, uh, of riches, and yet, generally speaking, people are not thankful, and the result is a turning away from God. And so you have in Romans one twenty one because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God to an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. And that's our culture. That's our society. And now, of course, we're, we're supposedly too smart to worship the created thing. But actually, I believe in our culture, we've rejected God and man is elevated uh, as divine. Uh, it's, it's the worship of man and the worship of self. And so, again, it begins with, uh, an unthankful heart. And just from a practical stand, standpoint, it might be good to challenge ourselves. Are we thankful people? Did you start your day giving thanks to God for all his benefits and all his goodness to you? And uh, I think if we have a thankful heart, it really can radically change our whole worldview and our whole life. Thankfulness is a wonderful thing. That's why Paul says, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So this time of judgment that we're going to see in chapter 9 doesn't come as normal from Israel's enemies on the outside. But actually, it comes from internal strife. So there's kind of a difference this time. There's no crying out to God for deliverance. God doesn't raise up a heathen enemy, but actually there's internal strife uh, that we're going to see and witness in this chapter um, between God's people. Uh, Gideon uh, had defeated Midian in our previous chapter, which we learned the name Midian means strife. He, he had won that victory, but the seeds sown in his family and in his fleshly behavior in later life would once again introduce strife to the Lord's people. And so this man, Abimelech, he's a type of the ambitious carnal man grasping for power and leadership among God's people. He, he's a picture to us of what we might call clericalism, and also of the Diotrephes syndrome. As you look at the early church, uh, began with humble shepherds. And how did we get from humble shepherds to popery, where men are basically bowing down and kissing the feet of a mere human, a fallible human? How did we get there? And basically, the answer is, uh, it was because of people wanting the place of preeminence that belongs to the Lord. And so that's really what we've got in this chapter. Uh, we've got this man, Abimelech, and the Lord is never once found on his lips, not once in this chapter. He comes as a place seeker and a power seeker, uh, and he's prepared to sacrifice and destroy anything that would hinder his getting place. And so the result is nothing but contention and trouble. And it ends in Abimelech destroying the people and the people ultimately destroying him. And it reminds us of a verse that we've often referred to in these studies, but I find it a very powerful and challenging verse. And it's Proverbs 13.10. And it says this, only by pride cometh contention. Uh, the only reason there's ever contention 
between nations, between the people of God, uh, in a marriage, uh, in a family. It's, it, you know, we can give all kinds of other reasons, but God says, Let, let's get rid of all the sham. I'm going to tell you the real reason why uh, there's contention. It's only by pride. And so we said his name means my father is king, Abimelech. Now, we're familiar with Abimelech because it was a title that was given to the Philistine kings. And it was handed down from father to son. And so we meet quite a number of Abimelechs in the book of Genesis uh, that are amongst the Philistines. And so this idea of my father is king has the idea of whole dynasty idea. And the, the, so although Gideon refused kingship, this son of a concubine who was poorly named Abimelech, my father is king, like what was Gideon thinking? Uh, and not just that, uh, you can imagine him growing up with that idea, my father is king. It might put visions of grandeur in the man's mind, and that's exactly what happened. And so Gideon refused kinship, but this son of a concubine would grasp at being king. And again, we said there's nothing spiritual about him. And isn't it a terrible thing when you see unspiritual men desiring leadership among the people of God. He, he, we're told in the New Testament by the Apostle Peter that we're not to lord it over God's heritage. And yet here's a man who is determined to lord it over God's heritage. He wanted uh, to be the preeminent one who ruled over the people. And we've said he wasn't raised up as a judge by God. There's nothing of God in his life. There's no mention of the spirit of the Lord coming upon him. He wasn't visited by the angel of the Lord. He didn't deliver the children of Israel. There's just nothing of God about him. And this chapter, if we just want to kind of outline, it's really it revolves around the parable of Jotham, actually the first parable in the Bible. And so, of course, it has great significance to us in, you know, principle of first mention. This is the first parable we're going to find in the scriptures. And this, this parable, it really kind of dominates the chapter. So verses one through six, which we read together, is the circumstances of the parable. Why did Jotham tell this parable? And so verse one through six is preparing the way. It's the circumstances of the parable. And then verses seven through 21 are the details of the parable. It's the actual parable itself that is told by, by Jotham, the one son of Gideon that escaped uh, of the 70 sons. And then from verse 22 to 57, the rest of the chapter is the fulfillment of the parable. So we read uh, in verse one, Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem. And so we just noticed that um, uh, he, he left Ophrah. Uh, this is where Gideon uh, had lived. Uh, verse 32, Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age, was buried in the sepulcher of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the Abiezerites. So that's where he would have been raised, and he left there, and he went to Shechem to his mother's brethren, to the brothers that were also uh, born to this woman who was Gideon's concubine. And so we start right here. Instead of associating with the spiritual descendants of Gideon, he associates with the carnal concubine's family, his mother's brethren. And that raises a very important question. Where do we find our fellowship? Where do we associate with? Do we associate with the spiritually minded people of God, or do we find it more comfortable being amongst the people of the world? And I believe there's something wrong if that's the case, that we're, we're trying to find a company in the wrong place. In Acts chapter 4, there's just an interesting scripture that when Peter and, and John were uh, released uh, from uh, the Pharisees uh, and the tribunal that they had, it says in verse 23 of Acts 4, it says, being let go, they went to their own company. <clears throat> 
been let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And I find that a delightful thing. Uh, they went to their own company. <clears throat> so we might ask the question, yes, the Lord Jesus was known as the friend of sinners, but it was for the purpose of redemption to, to reach their, their lost souls. And uh, <clears throat> he lived a life that was separated uh, from all of that which they found appealing. And, and so, yes, we, we don't want to be isolationists. We're not suggesting that. We're not suggesting we go off to a commune somewhere. But what we should say is that we delight to be amongst God's people. We prefer the company of God's people than that of unbelievers. And yet we must, uh, we, we can't isolate, so we must uh, associate with them, but it's always with the purpose of winning them uh, to the Savior. So this place, uh, uh, Shechem, uh, which is kind of central to this whole story, is a very interesting place. And so it's good to kind of get the background uh, to the place. It was actually in the valley between two mountains that you would know well from Scripture. One of them is Mount Gerizim, and the other is Mount Ebal. And between these two mountains, there's a valley. It was an important trade route. You know, if you're on a, a journey uh, and you're bringing goods, you don't want to go over a mountain if you can help it. So you would go between the mountains. So it was an important trade route. And there's very many significant spiritual connections with this place called Shechem. So let's just think of some of them. Uh, go back to the book of Joshua. Now, you might want to put a ribbon in Joshua chapter 24, because we may just uh, look there a few times um, <clears throat> and so uh, and, and consider uh, this, this particular portion of scripture. Uh, Joshua 24, and I want us to look at verse 32. It says, and the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of uh, Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And so, yes, there's some spiritual significance there because it's the place uh, where the man who was the the savior of the world, because uh, that's the name that's given to Joseph. Uh, it's a place where his bones were buried. So it has significance in that sense, but it has much more significance. Look at Genesis 35 as we consider this place, uh, Shechem, and just how significant it is in the Bible. And in Genesis 35 in verse 4, we read this, and they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. And so if you remember uh, when uh, Rachel and, of course, Lear, and Jacob fled, uh, we remember how Rachel took her father's household gods and she sat on the camel's uh, saddle. And, uh, well, this is where they were buried. So it was a place not only where Jacob's bones were buried, but it was a place where there was a putting away of idols. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 and verses 6 and 7, as we continue to think about this place of great significance in the word of God. Genesis 12 verses 6 and 7, it says, Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim, it says here, but it's the same place unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar to the Lord who appeared unto him. So it was a place where the promises of God to Abraham had been reiterated, had been given. It was a place where he had built an altar of worship to the Lord. And so, again, great significance. I said keep a ribbon in Joshua 24. Uh, go back there now, please. And we want to learn some more things about this place. It says in verse 1, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And then if you look at the verse 25 of the same chapter, it says, so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day 
and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. So it was a place of significance in many, many ways spiritually. There was a, uh, the, the people of Israel made a covenant with God to be his people. Remember Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people said, yes, we will also serve the Lord. And they entered into a covenant with God to serve the Lord in this place. And now look at what's happened in this very place. Look at chapter 9, Judges, and verse 4. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bereth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. The men of Shechem had now built a temple, a house for Baal of the Covenant. In the very place where a covenant had been made with Jehovah, who had delivered them from Egypt, brought them through the wilderness, brought them into the land, and, and given them this promised land. And in Shechem, they, they made a covenant with Joshua. We will be the people of God. We will obey him. We will follow him. And now in that very same place, they're making another covenant, but not with Jehovah, but with Baal. Baal beareth, Baal of the covenant. What they're saying is we are now going to make a covenant relationship to serve Baal and to worship him and obey him in that place of such spiritual significance. And of course, it, it shows to us that uh, in a place of spiritual significance, people can make some unspiritual decisions. Uh, and so we need to be conscious of that and uh, live up to the wonderful spiritual heritage uh, that, that we have in the house of God and be careful that we make decisions that are right decisions in the house of God to stay faithful to the Lord. But he did not. So he associates with the wrong people. Uh, he's in, in a sense, the wrong place because it's now a place that is associated with Baal of the Covenant and in verse 2, he makes an appeal. He says, speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, uh, whether it's better for you, either that all the sons of Jeroboam, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. So his appeal, of course, is one of self-interest. He appeals to the self-interest of the men of Shechem, really. Uh, he calls his father, not Gideon, but Jeroboam. And remember, Jeroboam uh, had, had the idea of let Baal plead. And, and again, the idea was that Gideon had pulled down this uh, altar of Baal uh, in his father's house. So he had been one who had destroyed Baal. Now they're back as Baal worshippers. And so he uses the name Jeroboam for Gideon because he wants to remind them, this is the man that destroyed Baal worship in the past. I want you to know that. This is, this is who he is. Not, not his name Gideon, but, but Jeroboam. And so he inflames the prejudice, really, of the Baal worshippers, right? He, he's the one that destroyed Baal's, Baal's idol. Interesting, too, he implies that um, the 70 sons of Jeroboam uh, wanted to reign over them, uh, over the people of Israel. And yet there's no indication of that whatsoever. Uh, they're still in Ophrah, and they seem to be very content with their lot uh, living in Ophrah. And uh, they, they, they don't seem to be in any way grasping after power or seeking uh, to, to rule and reign over the nation. But he, he says, <clears throat> appealing to them, <clears throat> isn't it better to have one man than 70 men? And by, by the way, isn't that so true? Uh, even to this day, uh, when you have this plurality of oversight, that is clearly taught in the New Testament, but many people still prefer to have one man to reign over them, forgetting that actually those plurality of oversight are under the one man who reigns over us. You see, people would say, uh, you know, might ask me, well, who is your pastor? And I love to tell them, 
Uh, actually, uh, we have a number of shepherds, uh, and we have an, the most amazing pastor you could ever imagine. He's the chief shepherd. He's the, the Lord Jesus, and he lives in the power of an endless life. We'll never have to replace him. Uh, we'll never have to, uh, you know, kind of uh, after so many years get someone else. We have the most perfect shepherd in our assembly. And then we have under shepherds, plur plural, under that chief shepherd. And so he's kind of asking them, what would you rather have? You want one man or do you want <clears throat> the 70 men? And then he reminds them, I'm born of your born and, and of your flesh. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in your family line. So appealing to this as well. So as we said, this man <clears throat> was the Old Testament equivalent of Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence. How different he is to John the baptizer. Don't you love John the baptizer's words? He must increase and I must decrease. Oh, this is the kind of men we want in leadership. Yeah. Men who want Christ to be all in all. They want, they want him to have that preeminent place. And, and they're happy uh, to just be simple, humble servants under a, an illustrious master, uh, the Lord Jesus. And so God deliver us from seeking a place. It's not far from any of us, even the disciples. Remember, they left all to follow the Lord Jesus. And yet there were times where they're, they're, they're discussing among themselves who will be the greatest among them in the kingdom. Mark 9.34 would be an example. And so even amongst these men who had made great sacrifice, left everything to follow the Lord Jesus, and yet they're vying for place. Who's going to be the greatest? And the Lord said to them, you know who the greatest of all is? He's the servant of all. Oh, what a, what a wonderful reminder for all of us that in God's economy, it's so different to the way the world thinks. In the world, everybody wants to be top dog. And there, it doesn't matter who you crush on the way up, but there's this rush to get to the top. And what the Lord Jesus says, in my economy, it's the very opposite. We should be fighting to get to the bottom <laughs> and not fighting in a bad way. But we should desire to have the place. If we really want greatness, the greatest of all, is the servant of all. And so here's a man, he wants the preeminence. And again, we might just say, trying to apply this practically, Lord, deliver us from seeking place. Lord, deliver us from, from self-elevation. Lord, deliver us from thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Lord, help us to, to just see that the best place to be is in the place of the Lord Jesus, where he was that perfect servant. Let's be like him. Let's, let's seek to serve and to minister to others and to, to take a lowly place. And so verse three, it says, his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. And so their hearts inclined to follow this ambitious man. He was a, he, one thing about these power hungry people is they're very good lobbyists they're good at going around and kind of getting support for their you know their 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 election if you like their place of power and so they certainly are willing their hearts were inclined to follow this ambitious man even though it's quite clear Gideon's sons were not trying to reign over them, but they certainly listened to this man. And again, sometimes these men who love a place of prominence, they can make a good case and they have an eloquence about them and they can, they can be very persuasive in the, the people's hearts deciding to follow this, this man. Of course, he needed financing. If he's going to, he's going to be successful, and so we see in verse four, it says, and they gave him three score and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bereth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons, which followed him. So he's given 70 pieces of silver. And as a result of this, he hires his own rent-a-mob, uh, uh, his own thugs, if you like, who will 
uh, kind of be his henchman uh, in his attempt to gain power. And so 70 uh, pieces of silver. And, and again, where is it coming from? It, it's coming from a unclean source. It's coming out of the house of Baal Bereth. He doesn't care where he gets his financing from. He's no principles. He just wants power. And so it doesn't matter where the money comes from. Uh, he's happy to take dirty money out of uh, an idol's temple uh, because it's going to forward his cord, cause. And so there's just a man without any real principles, without any integrity in the man at all. And of course, uh, he uses this funding for a, a very uh, tragic purpose. Uh, so he hires this mob, and it says in verse 5, he went to his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being three score and ten persons. So, so he's got 70 pieces of silver, and he hires hitmen, basically, uh, to kill the 70 sons of Gideon. And so... Uh, it's just an interesting thing that uh, each of Gideon's sons, if you think of it economically, were valued at one piece of silver. Now, if you think about that, that's a very low value of estimation put on these men. See, Joseph, when he was sold into slavery by his brethren, he was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Even the Lord Jesus was sold by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. And, and again, we realize that was a very low estimation uh, from the one who is so marvelous as the Lord Jesus. But, but nevertheless, Gideon's sons are only valued a, a single piece of silver each. And so that showed how little value he prayed, placed uh, on his siblings uh, through his father. So the silver, as we said, it came out of this house of Baal Bereth. It was acquired from the temple treasury of a false god. And uh, he basically, in accepting that money, it was a public announcement that he had renounced the God of Israel and was on the side of Baal. And so he takes these vain or worthless, uh, un light, un unimportant people um, to basically uh, kill these sons. I wonder, do, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? How, how do we value people? When it comes to the Lord's people, we're told in the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, when he's speaking to the shepherds that he calls the elders of Ephesus, he reminds them that they were to care for the people who had been purchased by the blood of God's own son. And I think if we, if we could get a hold of that, that God's people are incredibly valuable to God. He has paid the highest possible price for them. What a price was paid for you and I, the blood of God's own son. Nothing else could purchase our redemption. Nothing else could, could meet the costs, the demands to redeem us. And so our redemption price is very high. And certainly we should treat God's people the way God sees them, the way he estimates them, the way he values them as incredibly precious to him. And so it says that uh, he, the sons of Gideon are slain. And it tells us um, <clears throat> that they were slain on a stone. It says, and all the men, verse six of Shechem, gathered together at the house of my Lord, went and made Abimelech king, in the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And verse five, it says, they went to his father's house at Ophrah, slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being three score and ten persons upon one stone, notwithstanding yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So they're slowing on a stone. And I wonder, was it kind of a ritual slaughter? I mean, 70 men on one stone. So they obviously were slaughtered one at a time. And I suspect to you that it was, it was in a sense that they're, uh, they're ritually slaughtered maybe to appease Baal for the destruction of the grove by Gideon and the offering of the bullock on the altar 
or the or, or the rock in Judges chapter six. So now, uh, in a sense, to to appease Baal, uh, these sons are slain on one rock uh, in this ceremonial uh, manner. But Abimelech's plan was not perfectly executed because one of the sons of Gideon escaped called Jotham, which Jotham means Jehovah is perfect. Baal is certainly well flawed, but Jehovah is perfect. And so this youngest son managed to escape. And so <clears throat> Abimelech was taken and he was made king. His ambition was realized, but it wouldn't be a, a, a story that goes like this, and they all lived happily ever after. The place that he is made uh, to be uh, king, it says, they, they gathered to the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So obviously there's a significant marker here, a pillar in Shechem. Uh, some uh, translations have an oak uh, of the pillar in uh, King James margin says the oak of the pillar. And it was most likely the oak of Mora uh, back again in Genesis chapter 12, this oak of, of Mora where <clears throat> Gideon, uh, uh, sorry, where Abraham had built an altar. Uh, verse six, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Sikkim, in the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham, said unto thy seed, will I give this land? And here builded he an altar to the Lord who appeared unto him. And so the very place where God had revealed and promised to give the land to Abraham, and obviously some kind of marker was put there of the significance of it, as well as the altar. It's also quite significant too, that this, this site um, was, was also significant because, remember, we said that Shechem is between two mountains. And these two mountains are Ebal and Gerizim, and they are connected with blessings and cursings. It, it was this site the nation of Israel heard the blessings and cursings read from the law and promised to obey the Lord. And so it's a place where the acoustics are absolutely magnificent. And, and again, I, I, I've been there and, and that's, you can see why, because you can, you can stand on it and it's like a little amphitheater in the middle. You can hear uh, clearly uh, the, the words being spoken. So it's a place of, of great spiritual significance uh, where Joshua gave his last speech, leading the people to reaffirm their obedience to the Lord. Uh, it was, as we saw, Jacob buried his idols here. It's a place of great, great significance. And it's a place, sadly, now where they made this worthless man to be their king. But thankfully there, as we said, God did not leave himself without a witness. The Lord is so good at this. So often it seems like evil is ready to triumph. And it seems like the, the righteous are close to being exterminated, and yet God always finds a way uh, to preserve uh, his remnant. And so uh, we see lots of incidents like that. If you remember uh, when we did First Samuel and Doeg uh, slaughtered the priests, but one of them, uh, Ahitub, the, the son of Abiathar, escaped. And so there was, there was one preserved. Uh, Joash was hidden during the reign, uh, the reign of terror of Queen Athaliah. And yet uh, he was hidden in the house of God. And so God preserved the lineage. And so God is so good at that. He's, he's good at preserving his testimony, even when things get low, when things get bleak, when things seem hopeless, God is so good at preserving the testimony, even if it's just a small remnant. But, and again, we don't want to, we don't want to love the, and worship the day of small things uh, because 
the, we want the Lord to be magnified on the earth and we want multitudes to come to know him and we want to be part of something much bigger not for our glory, but for his glory. But, but nevertheless, we recognize sometimes things get, get low, things get bleak, but God is preserving. Uh, but it's always with a view of expanding, uh, of, of expanding his work. So now we get in verse 7 through 21 to the details of the parable of Jotham. When news of the coronation of Abimelech reached Jotham, he came out of hiding and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim. Look at verse 7. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that, that God may hearken unto you. And we said it was a place of perfect acoustics. So everybody would have heard him uh, from Mount Gerizim. And uh, it, actually, we would have, perhaps if we would have written this, we might have had it the other way around, uh, because um, <clears throat> Mount Ebo was the mount where the curses for a broken law were read. And maybe if we had have written it, we'd have had him on the Mount of Curses, because in a sense, uh, what's happening is very much like a curse on the people of Israel. Uh, and so we might have done it that way, but it's done the other way. He's on the Mount of Blessing, and he condemns the wickedness of the men of Shechem. And so as he does, he does it by means of a parable. And remember, we said this is the first parable recorded in Scripture. And it certainly and clearly refers back to chapter 8 and verse 22 and 23. So it might be good for us just to read that before we proceed any further. It, Chapter 8, verse 22 and 23, it says, Then the men of Israel said to, unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, neither will my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So this parable has this background to it. And it's about trees which often are used to speak of men in the Bible. Now, we're not going to take the time to go through all of these illustrations or look at them in the scriptures, but you'll be familiar with them. And so in Daniel chapter 4, for instance, and verse 20 through 22, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is portrayed as a tree. And, of course, all the birds shelter in it, and then the tree is the, cut down by the watchers and it falls down on the ground, but there's a little bit left. And of course, the application of the, the dream is that Nebuchadnezzar is the tree that's been referred to in the story. So there, there's an example of a man referred to as a tree. Uh, in Mark 8, verse 24, when the Lord Jesus healed the blind man, he said, I see men as trees walking. And then, of course, perhaps one of the most familiar ones to all of us is Psalm 1, verse 3. The man who delights in the law of the Lord is like a tree by the rivers of water. And if you remember, he bears his fruit in his season. So uh, trees often are used in Scripture in a parabolic manner to speak of men. And so in this instant, we're going to see the same thing. And so the, the, the kind of quick picture of the parable, now we're almost at the close of our session here, so we're not going to get a chance to do the whole parable, but next time we'll go into detail. But I want to give you the big picture just initially, and then we'll go into the details. I want to suggest to you that this parable, the trees are the men of Shechem. The fruitful trees would have been Gideon, who refused kingship. And the bramble was speaking of Abimelech, who grasped at kingship. And so this is the story. <clears throat> so it says in verse 8, The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? 
So as we said, trees represent the men of Shechem. Uh, they want somebody to rule over them. The fruitful trees would picture, although there's three different ones used, but they really picture Gideon, who was fruitful for God, um, but refused kingship. And then the bramble that is eager to be king and be made king over them is Abimelech. And of course, this bramble is a kind of a thorny character who's nothing but destructive in anything but fruitful. And it is true to say this, that when we have carnal, ambitious men who grasp at power amongst God's people, it rarely ever produces good fruit amongst God's people, but it invariably causes dissension, division, and produces what carnal, carnality alone can produce, and that is a fleshly scene of devastation. And so by way of practical application, as we uh, bring this session to a close, I would suggest to you that it's really important for us to pray earnestly for God to raise up spiritual men, men who love the Lord, uh, men who love his word, humble men, uh, but men who love the flock, who, who care and see the value of the people of God, see them as blood-bought precious saints and are willing to pour their life into divine service in ministering to God's people. Oh, how desperately we need such men. May God encourage us and challenge us with these thoughts and Lord deliver us from bramble men, <laughs> men who would be king when we already have one who has the preeminent place, the Lord Jesus. Amen.